Right. All right, guys, so um, can someone move my projector? I think they've been cleaning that. And that's not what the phone down on me now. Okay, so if you look on Moodle, this is paper one. All right, and I, I don't think you can see much from home. So go to Moodle. Um, I've given you the same, uh, the textbook questions that you need to do. So the people who are here, and I've printed for you guys, the little hard sheets of textbook questions that you can work through. And the, the, I think the, the model answers are already open on Moodle. But you need to work it out and then check. Alright, and you can see here, as I'm going along, I'm going to, oh, did I change this? Oh, this is, okay, so anyway, I did change this this morning, but it's not showing. Um, okay, so this one here is where we are. 2019, it's actually 2020, intro, evolution, phylogenetic trees, etc. And then at the bottom here, you can see I've got all the notes that we did last year, all the little activities. And we'll give you most of them. Right, but it doesn't mean we're going to do all of them, but we'll show you them, okay? And then there's the model answers to the textbook. And I've even got um, an old prelim question that I'm going to just give you, all right? And um, then... Oh, so then PowerPoint 1 I'm going to look at this morning. And then I've got other ones here as well, all right? But the one that I'm using to teach is Mrs. Pages, because she's put one together, it's in a bit of a different order to mine, but that story still follows. And we want to try and keep together, and because it, mine has lots of activity, you can still go and look at it in other pictures, birds will, mine, will pick up quicker. But we'll still get the same story. Just that we're keeping together, basically. All right, but like I said, I'm still going to use some of these. So on Google Classroom is her PowerPoint. Um, it's a nice dark blue one, and she's still busy with it. All right, but we're also going to start here today. But just to begin with, I want us to watch this little video. It's also on Google. No, it's not. Uh, it's on Google Classroom. I need to transfer the class. is evolution. Evolution is the development of life on Earth. This is a process that began billions of years ago and is still continuing to this day. Evolution tells us how it was possible for the enormous diversity of life to develop. It shows us how primitive protozoa could become the millions of different species that we see today. Evolution then is the answer to the question that we have all asked on seeing the Dachshund and the Great Dane together. How is it possible for ancestors to have descendants that look so very different to them? In answering this question, we want to focus on animals, excluding other forms of life such as fungi and plants. The first question to ask is therefore, how can one animal develop into a whole new species of animal? Ah, but just a quick question, what exactly is a species? A species is a community of animals that is capable of producing offspring with one another, with those offspring also being capable of reproducing in turn. To understand this answer better, we need to take a closer look at the following points. The uniqueness of living creatures guaranteed through the excess production of offspring and heredity. And, as a second key point, selection. Let's begin with uniqueness. Every creature that exists is unique, and this is essential for evolution. The members of a species may strongly resemble each other in appearance, however, they all have slightly different.
different traits and characteristics. They may be a bit bigger, fatter, stronger or bolder than their fellow animals. So what is the reason for these differences? Let's take a closer look at a creature. Every creature is made up of cells. These cells have a nucleus. The nucleus contains the chromosomes. And the chromosomes hold the DNA. DNA consists of different genes. And it's these genes that are life's information carriers. They contain instructions and orders for the cells and determine the characteristics and traits that living creatures have. And it's precisely this DNA that is unique to every creature. It's slightly different from individual to individual, which is why each has slightly different characteristics. But how is the enormous range of DNA created? One key factor is the excess production of offspring. In nature, we can observe that creatures generally produce far more offspring than is necessary for the survival of their species, with many offspring dying an early death as a result. Often, there are even more offspring than the environment in which they live is able to support. This is one factor in increasing diversity within a species. The more offspring that are produced, the more little differences occur. And this is what nature wants, as many little differences as possible. The second major cause of the uniqueness of individuals occurs in heredity itself. By the way, heredity means the passing on of DNA to offspring. Two very interesting factors come into play in this process. Recombination and mutation. Recombination is the random mixing of the DNA of two creatures. When two creatures fall in love and mate, they recombine their genes twice. The first time they do this separately, when they generate the gametes, that is, sperm and egg cells. The gametes take half of the genes and shuffle them. The second recombination occurs when the male inseminates the female. The parents each provide 50% of their DNA, in other words, 50% of their unique traits and characteristics. These are then recombined or mixed, and the result is new offspring. These offspring have a random mix of the DNA, and therefore the traits and characteristics of their parents. This increases the diversity and differences within a species even further. But mutations are also important for evolution. Mutations are random changes in DNA. These can also be described as copying errors within the DNA, triggered by toxins or other chemical substances, or by radiation. A mutation exists when a part of the DNA is altered. These changes are often negative, and may result in illnesses such as cancer. However, they may also have neutral or positive effects, such as the blue eye color in humans, which is one such random mutation. In all cases, a mutation has to affect a gamete, that is a sperm or egg cell. Because only the DNA in the gametes is passed on to the offspring. This is also the reason why we protect our sexual organs during x-rays, whilst other parts of the body are not at risk. In summary then, in the heredity process, creatures pass on their characteristics to their offspring in the form of DNA. Recombination and mutation change the DNA, so that each child looks different to its siblings and receives a random mix of the characteristics of its parents. There's a key word here. Random. All of these processes are based on chance. Random recombination and mutations result in individuals with random mixes of traits and characteristics, which in turn mix these randomly and pass them on. But how can so much be down to chance when all living creatures are so perfectly adapted to their environment? For example, the stick insect, the hummingbird, and the frogfish. The answer is provided by the second key point, selection. Each individual is subjected to a process of natural selection. 
As we have learned, each individual is somewhat different to its fellows, and there is extensive variation within a species. Environmental influences have an effect on living creatures. The so-called selection factors include predators, parasites, animals of the same species, toxins, changes in habitat, or the climate. Selection is a process that each individual is subjected to. Every creature has a unique mix of traits and characteristics. This mix helps them to survive in their environment, or not, as the case may be. Anyone with an unsuitable mix will be selected from the environment. Those with the right mix survive and can pass on their enhanced traits and characteristics. This is why diversity is so important. This is why creatures make so much effort to produce offspring that are as different as possible. They increase the likelihood that at least one of their offspring passes nature's selection process. They maximize their chances of survival. A good example of this can be seen in a group of finches living on a remote island. They are some of the most famous animals in the world of science and are known as Darwin finches after their discoverer, Charles Darwin. And this is the story of those finches. A few hundred years ago, a small group of finches was blown onto the Galapagos Islands in the middle of the Pacific, probably by a big storm. The finches found themselves in an environment that was completely new to them, a real finch paradise, an abundance of food and no predators. They reproduced rapidly and numerously. The islands were soon heaving with finches. This meant that food supplies became increasingly scarce. The finch paradise was threatened with famine and finch friends became competitors. This is when selection intervened. Their individuality and small differences, in this case their slightly different beaks, meant that some of the birds were able to avoid competing with their fellow finches. The beaks of some of the finches were more suitable for digging for worms. Other finches were able to use their beaks better for cracking seeds. The finches consequently sought out ecological niches. In these niches, they were safe from excessive competition. They soon began to mate primarily with other finches that used the same niche. Over the course of many generations, these characteristics were enhanced, enabling the finches to exploit their niches successfully. The differences between the worm diggers and the seed crackers became so large that they were no longer able to mate with one another. Different species emerged as a result. Today there are 14 different species of finch living on the Galapagos Islands, all of which are descended from the same group of stranded finches. This is how new species are created by evolution. Through the interaction of unique individuals, the excess production of offspring, recombination and mutation in heredity, and finally, through selection. Why is this so important? It tells us where the variety of life comes from and why living creatures are so perfectly adapted to their habitats. But it also affects us personally. Every person is the result of three and a half billion years of evolution. And that includes you. Your ancestors fought and adapted in order to survive. This survival was an extremely uncertain thing. If we consider the fact that 99% of all the species that have ever lived are extinct, then you can consider yourself part of a success story. The dinosaurs have disappeared, but you are alive, watching this video. Because you're incredibly special, just like all the other creatures that exist today. Irreproducible and unique in the universe. You know, nearly everything did. That's why I'm going to put that on Google and you need to watch it again and again and again. And that's why I was writing some words. Can the guys at home see my words? On the board. Yeah, not fully, but Can I put yeah. the let me put the light on? 
Okay, so that little video, that little video, I really love it. It's a lovely little animation. It talks about a lot of the principles that we talk about when we, you know, when we talk about evolution, the theory of evolution. So hang on, what is a theory? All right, I'm going to take it a step further. We know that it happened. How do we know that it happened? Because there is evidence. Okay, am I saying to you, you have to believe in the theory of evolution? No. But it's a theory, just like the, you know, to, um, what's his name? Gregor Mendel came up with genetics and we've got this whole genetics field and um, we've got all these different fields that have grown out of nothing. And it's all based on evidence. We now know that there's um, DNA with genes and genes mutate and everything. So based on the evidence of um, what's been found, the theory of evolution, it is fact. But we're not saying you have to believe in it. We're not saying it at all. And I even struggle with some of the, um, the, the wording. I struggle with it, you know. Um, for example, uh, this guy said, what did he say, the wording? Oh, how can something so beautiful, the one with the little um, hummingbird and the one, I can't remember what the other picture was. How can these wonderful organisms arise by chance? To me, it's almost planned, a, a higher superpower planning. You know what I'm trying to say? But we're not trying to say, guys, this is what you have to believe. You know, we, we're not trying, and people always ask me, so what about religion? Guys, we're not trying to say, that evolution, evolution answers religion and religion answers evolution. We're not saying that at all. We're just showing you the evidence and how someone like Darwin and the people that he worked with and the people that influenced him, how him and other people came up with this theory. All right? And how that you, know, you have to collect evidence. You can't um, prosecute a criminal unless you have evidence. So they are innocent until proven guilty. And the same thing here, theory, there's enough facts to say that evolution exists, but we're not saying that you have to believe in it. Because even myself, there's some parts that, hmm, how does something as perfect as the eye, and an octopus has an eye that is very similar to ours, but also different. How does something so perfect evolve by random mutations? To me, that just doesn't make sense. All right, so that's where I think, no, there must be something controlling, guiding, and that's where, that's where kind of like, you know, then I get a little bit, doesn't make sense to me. Does that, is, that, is what I've said okay? Is there anything you want to add to it? So it's a lovely story, okay? Um, and while, while I was watching this, I was writing these words. And I don't know if you realize that everything that we've been talking about in grade 12 syllabus, it's here. We're bringing it together, aren't we? Because we've, been, we've talked about, um, you know, we did the whole structure of DNA. We, we understand that DNA, you know, there are genes, and we understand that there are random mutations. All those mutations could be caused by chemicals in the environment or whatever. And blue eyes, the first person to have blue eyes was in Ethiopia. I don't know how many hundreds of years, you know, thousands of years ago. I don't know that. I can't remember that. But random mutations allow for what we see, the differences in us. And the differences in us or in anything, um, you're aware that wild dogs all look different, that dolphins can recognize each other by their spots. So all organisms look different. Lions look different. Some of them have skinny faces, round faces, big manes, short manes. There's random variation there as well. And it's all because of mutations. So all organisms have DNA, they all have genes, they all have alleles for genes. You know, remember what alleles are? Like different versions of the gene brown, uh, blue, green, etc. eyes. Many spots, few spots, big spots, irregular spots, okay? Or wild dogs, a different coat color or whatever. So mutations drive evolution. But, okay, so there's that word evolution. It means change over time. So what is microevolution? And why am I omitting it here with mutations and sexual reproduction? Yeah. So within each species, and we also need to talk about, well, he mentioned species. A species is a group 
of similar organisms that can reproduce, they live together, they reproduce, and they can produce fertile offspring who can mate with others and reproduce and pass on those genes. All right? So my question was, what is microevolution? Microevolution evolution changes is the differences we see in us. All right? But we are still one species. And we're more, we more globally one species now than ever before. But imagine if way back when, because they say that humans, um, well, the first humans, so Homo erectus evolved in Africa and then evolved into Homo sapiens. That's the one theory. And then Homo sapiens moved and inhabited different parts of the world. Australia, North America, um, Asia, South America, etc. Imagine if they never met again. There might be enough microevolution changes that you end up with a different species in North, uh, South America, North America, Europe, Asia, and I should be doing that way. Do you see what I mean? If they separated for long enough, then you could end up with different species. But because humans have moved around and you know they, we, and we, we're now so globally related, you know that we are still one species even more. We've just got so much microevolutionary um, differences. Okay, but if we were separated, so that's what I wrote here. If organisms are separated for a long time, like Darwin's finches. So Darwin, when he went to South America, he traveled on, we'll get to that. This is an introduction to that. He traveled on the beagle, the ship the beagle. He was a doctor and he went on his, on, um, with them and he, he collected lots of specimens and evidence. And over like 20 years, he came up with his theory of natural selection which is eventually what we're going to be leading up to. Um, so he postulated that. He saw lots of different finches, little birds with different shaped beaks on islands, and he thought, but hang on, they look very similar to the birds on the mainland. So could those birds on the mainland have been somehow um, blown or whatever, Fle flew there on a strong wind, they landed on the islands, and then they were separated on the islands for long enough that eventually they became different species with big beaks, small beaks, because they feed on, well initially they were seed eaters. The common ancestors were seed eaters, having a small little beak, and then because they were um, found in different niches, different islands with different habitats, terrains, etc., and different food sources, by chance, some of them, just like by chance, we end up being taller, shorter, long nose, short nose, blue eyes, green eyes, variations. By chance, some of them ended up having bigger beaks. They survived. They mated with other big beak birds. They passed on their genes. The other guys, they couldn't survive. Theory of natural selection. That's what it is. Okay? So, what I'm trying to say is that the finches that moved, that somehow got to the islands, there were already microevolution changes. Some of them had slightly bigger, smaller, rounder, fatter, whatever beaks. But over time, eventually, there was, you know, they could cope with different niches on the different islands, and eventually, they evolved, and I should have drawn these arrows longer, they evolved into different species. So there are now 14 different species of finches on the Galapagos Islands, and they they no longer mate with one another. There's been enough microevolutionary change that led to macroevolution. So macroevolution, big evolution, is when you get new species formed. We are still one species. There's lots of microevolutionary um, differences between us because we have got mutations. Um, there's lots of variation between us, but we're still one species. We can still breed and pass on our genes and produce fertile offspring. Okay, I'm just going to finish this and then I'll stop the video because I don't want it to be too long. So, okay, so what have I mentioned? I've mentioned mutations. They could be random. They happen by random. What gene mutates? Could be due to a chemical, UV radiation. It could be by chance, blue eyes, whatever. Okay? Um, and sexually, reproduction is involved in that. That whole story about DNA meiosis, about... Um, crossing over of the homologous chromosome, mixing of genes that end up in the gametes, random assortment sorry, of homolo homolo homologous chromosomes at the equator, separation into gametes, which genes go into which gametes. Sexual reproduction brings about variation. Mutations that are random and happen by chance 
also bring out variation. So you end up with this melting pot of lots of different alleles for a gene. And that leads to, first of all, microevolution, lots of differences, variation. But if the groups are separated long enough, or sometimes not even separated, we'll get to that later, then it could lead to macroevolution where they are now so different that they no longer can interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring. So think of, I never get this right. So horses crossed with donkeys, you get, I think it's in one of my PowerPoints, a picture, but I can't remember it, a mule. But that mule is sterile. It can't then mate with other mules and make more mules and become a new species. It's just that the, the horse and the donkey are genetically similar enough that they can still breed, but the, the offspring, the mule, is no longer uh, it's sterile. It can't, there's something wrong there. All right, so they are two separate species. They produce a hybrid, but um, mules are not a, a species on their own. They're just a random hybrid that can't reproduce and, and pass on offspring, pass on genes to offspring. All right, so are we getting the idea? Not that hard. That's why I love that video. You really need to watch it again like once a week, because you're going to pick up on all the little things that we're trying to pull together. So at the bottom here, macroevolution, once there's been, there's been enough change and separation, there could be separation, all right, and like the finches, they were occupying new niches, different food sources, and then they tended to mate with their own kind, all right, um, just like if humans were separated on different continents, that's my own little story, and if they never met again, you might have you might have different species in, a, in Australia compared to here, compared to North America. Maybe we would have been very different, but we're not because there has been, what is it called, gene flow between us. We're still one species though, but there's lots of variation. Okay, got it. All right, guys, I'm just, just going to stop this video. It's going to be too long.